Hi guys, Aaron Dorr here, director of Iowa Gun Owners. And if you guys have been following the gun rights fight for more than about five seconds, you know that anti-gun lobbyists, anti-gun politicians, you know, Bloomberg funded front groups are always trying to tell you and I that if we simply had more gun free zones, if we had more areas where you and I couldn't carry, we would lower crime rates because after all, when you take guns away from people, then obviously the bad guys won't carry there and then no more bad things will happen. We all know that's preposterous. We all know that madmen target gun-free zones looking because they know that in, in those places, you and I can't fight back. It doesn't matter, for example, here in Iowa, that we have a shell issue permit system and stand your ground law if you're in a gun-free zone where you have to disarm yourself before going inside. You can't fight back. Now, we all know we all know intuitively that madmen target these areas. But we, take, uh, we have taken the time here at Iowa Gun Owners to compile a lengthy report to show you just exactly how deadly gun-free zones actually are. The purpose of this video then is to help remind all of us that if we surrender an inch of territory to gun grabbers, for example, give them some gun-free zones to add the, the list here in Iowa, we are simply going to put more and more people in jeopardy as madmen know exactly where to go to carry out their next attack. And also to realize that we're not fighting for some kind of a, you know, philosophical concept or some sterile document from the 1700s. Real people live and die every day in this country based on their access to a defensive firearm. And the more laws that we have on the books to make it harder for them to get them, to carry them, to use them, to employ them, the more innocent people are going to pay the price in blood. So check out the following case studies. So the next time some weak need lawmaker tries to tell you why you should back some kind of gun control like gun-free zones, you'll have the facts. Case number one, April 2018, at the, a, a Metro Nashville, Tennessee Waffle House, Travis Renkin walked inside a very well-known gun-free zone, killed four people and wounded four more because no one there uh, could, could fight back. That was one of the reasons why he could get away with this. Case number two, a case that we're never going to forget. Nobody will. February 2018, Nicholas Cruz walked into the Parkland Florida High School and shot and killed 17 people in a gun-free zone. No one could fight back. There was no teacher. There was no administrator. Uh, there was no parent who was there who could return fire and stop this guy. And yeah, they had an SRO, but the size of today's school complexes, this was a massive place, and th there's no way that one or two SROs can be everywhere. And of course, as we all know in this case, this guy was absolutely a coward who did nothing to try to save these kids. And that's the point. The more adults, the more teachers, the more parents, the more coaches, the more janitors in a school who have the option to carry, the greater chance that our children have at surviving one of these types of shootings. In that case, 17 people died and 17 more were wounded. Case number three, November 2017, Sutherland Springs, Texas, Baptist Church, a massacre, 26 people died. Thanks to Devin Kelly's uh, murder spree, 20 more were wounded before he was finally stopped by a neighbor with an AR-15. But in Texas, it's a gun-free zone in churches. You can't carry in churches in Texas without having specific permission from the church in advance. And we all know that the reality is insurance underwriters dictate these policies, and you're simply not going to get it. Not going to get it. And no one had it in that church there where 26 people were died. Uh, were, were murdered, rather. Case number four, Stephen Paddock, Las Vegas, Nevada, 2017, a gun-free zone. He walked into Mandolin Bay, the hotel, the resort complex there, a total gun-free zone, and he launched his attack onto an outdoor music amphitheater, another gun-free zone, and he killed tons and tons of people. 58 died, 422 were wounded with gunfire, hundreds more wounded by stampeding, being stampeded by those who were trying to escape, all in a gun-free zone. 
at corporate gun control was to blame in case number five, a gun-free zone at Fiamma Manufacturing. I might have pr uh, pronounced that wrong, but it's in Florida, Fiamma Manufacturing, June 2017. John Newman walked inside, killed five people because he had been fired from this corporation. So in retaliation, he killed five people. No one there could fight back because no one had a firearm, thanks to their gun-free zone policy. Case number six, a bizarre case. Esteban Santiago flew in from Alaska to Fort Lauderdale, Florida, had checked his firearms in accordance with the TSA protocol, landed in Fort Lauderdale, it's January 2017, got his bags from the carousel, went to a bathroom, loaded his firearms, came out, killed five people, wounded six more. The entire area was a gun-free zone. No one could fight back and five people died. Case number seven involved the Cascade Mall, and like most malls in America, this was a gun-free zone where you and I could not carry. Uh, this one involved uh, Archaean uh, Seton, I can't quite pronounce the name perhaps, took a Ruger 1022, walked into the food court, this is on September 23, 2016, and he murdered five people. They couldn't fight back, again, a gun-free zone. Omar Mateen, a self-avowed Islamic terrorist who attacked a nightclub in Florida, chose a nightclub, probably, uh, based on reports that we have seen, in part because he knew that, you know what, they can't fight back here because nightclubs are off limits to gun owners in Florida. 49 people died. 53 more were wounded. Folks, the attack drug on for over four hours, over four hours before police could get inside the building, June 12, 2016. And all that time, nobody could fight back, nobody could drop that man with a, with a bullet to the brain because they were in a gun-free zone. That was case number eight. Case number nine, another bizarre case, an Uber driver who was on the clock for Uber, and of course Uber is well known for being a gun-free zone, so their drivers can't carry and their passengers can't be carrying, yet on February of 2016, Jason Dalton, an Uber driver on the clock, drove around to three different areas and murdered five people for reasons uh, yet unknown in a violent murder spree. And again, had you been there, had you been in his car, you couldn't have stopped him because you can't carry thanks to Uber's policies. This is just ridiculous. Case number 10, a husband and wife terrorist team, Syed Farouk and Tashfeen Malik, Islamic terrorists, self-avowed, these are their words, not mine, attacked a office party, a Christmas office party in San Bernardino, California, December of 2015. And they also chose it in part because they knew the entire complex was off limits to gun owners. 14 people died, 22 more were wounded in this attack. That was the same case in case number 11, June 2015. The community college in Roseburg, Oregon, Roseburg, Oregon, Christopher Mercer, a disgruntled, angry student, walked inside, killed nine people, wounded eight more because no one could fight back. No one could fight back. One of the folks that he wounded, and thankfully this, this young man survived, was a young military veteran named Chris Mintz. Now, Chris was a deployed veteran. He got back, he got back from service, combat vet. Numerous awards for valor and all kinds of service ribbons. He knew how to fight back. However, he couldn't carry here. So when he got back to Oregon as a young man, he had a young daughter. He wanted to get his career going. So he was going to local community college to further his career. And he hears the gunshots. And he told reporters later on that he could have dropped that guy if he had a firearm. But he had nothing because the school policies and the state code, I believe it was, uh, precluded from doing so. So when, the, when, when Christopher Mercer rounded the corner, all Chris Mintz could do was rush the guy with his bare hands. That's the measure of the man. You know, had he had a firearm, he could have and would have dropped that guy right there. Instead, Chris Mintz rushed this guy with his bare hands and he took five bullets for his troubles. Miraculously, he survived the attack, but that just shows the insanity of these policies that leave a young veteran, in this case, unable to fight back. Case number 12 involved a church, as many of these uh, shootings do, because many, many states, not Iowa, deem churches off limits to gun owners. Case number 12, Dylan Roof attacked a church in Charleston, South Carolina, June 2015, and he killed nine people in a racially motivated murder spree. 
Case number 13, October of 2014, another school here, Marysville High School uh, in Maryland, uh, involved Jalen Freiberg, an angry student who walked inside the cafeteria, killed four, wounded one more in another gun-free zone. Nobody could fight back. No teacher, no janitor, no cafeteria worker, nothing. The Navy Yard in Washington, D.C. is a site for case number 14. Aaron Alexis walked inside there September 16, 2013, armed with a Remington 870 shotgun in this well-publicized gun-free zone and gunned down 12 people before he was shot by responding SWAT officers. And that's great that they got there and shot him, but 12 people died and three more wounded first. Why not let the people who were there have access to a firearm and they could have shot him themselves? To me, that's a, a much better idea. Pardon the heavy sarcasm. I, I just get furious when you consider the actual implications, the real life implications of gun control like this. This is what's gonna happen if we allow more and more gun control to pass into law. Case number 15, a case we're never gonna forget here in America, um, the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting. Um, December 14, 2012, Newtown, Connecticut, 27 uh, students and teachers were gunned down by Adam Lanza in a gun free zone. Of course, it spawned Obama's massive years long gun control movement, ultimately unsuccessful. Uh, but again, a gun free zone where teachers, you know, parents, adults on campus there could not fight back. Case number 16. Uh, September 2012, Minneapolis, Minnesota, Accent Signage Systems involved a disgruntled employee named Andrew uh, El uh, Eglinder who walked in there and shot and killed six people, wounded two more after being fired from his job. The place was very loudly a no-guns-allowed, no gun-free zone facility, and six people died in part because of that. If you guys are tired of hearing all these numbers, just imagine what it's like to be in one of these types of situations. You know how to defend yourself. You know how to fight back. You've got your Glock 9 in your car or your Colt 45 in your car or at your house because you can't carry at work, whatever the case may be. You know how to defend yourself. Imagine what that's like hearing those gunshots come down the hall and knowing that you can't save anybody else. And you can't save yourself because some stupid politician has decided that in this area, self-defense is off limits. Absolutely maddening. Uh, three more cases. Three more cases. Case number 17, Oak Creek, Wisconsin. Uh, August 2012, Wade Page attacked a Sikh temple fueled by a racial or religious hatred towards this, uh, this church group, killed six people, Wounded four more in a church building that was clearly marked as being gun-free. Case number 18 led a sweeping gun control in Colorado. July 20, 2012, James Holmes attacked the Aurora, Colorado movie theater. Now, his stated goal was to get as many bodies as he could. He killed 12, wounded 62 more, and he said that on his way to the theater, he drove past other places with higher populations like airports and other facilities, and he passed because of their, quote, substantial security, end quote. The theater that Holmes chose on purpose was the only one in Aurora at that time anyway that was a gun-free zone. He went there on purpose. Case number 19 involved U.S. Army Major Nadal Hassan, another Islamic terrorist motivated shooting. He shot and killed 14 people, wounded 33 more at the Fort Hood military complex in Fort Hood, Texas. Again, November of 2009. He fired 214 rounds before being shot by responding officers. 214 rounds. All these soldiers in this massive uh, readiness processing center, not one of them could have a gun to fight back. 214 rounds fired, 14 dead, 33 wounded before he was finally put down and wounded and actually paralyzed by responding officers. And last but not least, the deadliest attack in New York State since 9-11, this is April 3rd, 2009, at a, um, an educational facility designed to help immigrants um, adapt and um, get used to American culture, uh, Jiverly Vong opened fire 
at the Civic Association Immigration Center, April 3rd, 2009, for reasons unknown. Uh, 13 people dead, four more people wounded before he took his own life. And it took officers 43 minutes to set foot in the building. 43 minutes where people were on their own and helpless against an armed massacre. That is case number 20. 20 cases spanning 10 years. And again, make no mistake, these are just the high profile cases. There's probably 20 more out there that we chose not to put in this report because the body count was only, note my heavy sarcasm, only one or two people. These are only the high profile cases that you and I all know about. These are the high profile cases that gun grabbers use to try to convince you and I to accept gun control. In our, in our opinion, and it's based on the facts, this is exactly the opposite conclusion that should be reached. 20 cases, 10 years, 300 people murdered. 662 people that were shot and wounded but did survive. Almost 1,000 people, almost 1,000 people in America in 10 years over these 20 cases who were shot in gun-free zones where criminals are supposed to not have the, a firearm present, where you and I are certainly disarmed because we actually follow law in the first place. 20 cases, 10 years, 1,000 people killed or wounded, yet gun grabbers want you and I to agree to more gun control, to agree to expanding the areas where you and I can't carry. Guys, again, we're not fighting for just our, our, our history, our heritage, you know, for a generic Second Amendment document, some kind of a, a philosophical concept. This is real blood. These are real people who are dead because of stupid policies that allow them no ability to fight back besides their hands. And that to me, and I'm sure to you, is absolutely unacceptable. And that's what happens when we allow gun control to pass in any format. So take a moment after you've watched this video, let these numbers sink in for a few moments, share it with your friends and family. Make sure that other gun owners know what happens in gun-free zones. Make sure they know what happens when you and I concede on any more of these types of gun-free zones, we're going to have a situation like this happen in Iowa. The best chance we have to stop that, to preclude that, is to put more guns in the hands of more law-abiding citizens. Any reporter, any lawmaker, any candidate, any Bloomberg-funded mouthpiece who tries to tell you otherwise is either A, lying to you knowingly, or B, just stupid. In either case, don't listen to it. Don't agree with it. Help us fight back and stop gun control in any format here in Iowa. Join up today. Our website is www.iowagunowners.org. Guys, get set up today and more to come. Share, share, share this video. Thank you.